Welcome back to the channel. My name is Lisa Elvin Stoltori, and I'm a genealogist and a passionate traveler. Over the last few years, I've been featuring each Fijoa, or King's Daughter, and getting to know their stories a little bit better. There are over 700 of them, so we've got a long way to go. Today, we're featuring episode 231. Let's begin, but before we begin, let's um, show you ways you can support the channel. The first three keep you in the know. Subscribe, like, and notify. The next few ways are ways to help the channel grow. Coffee and Patreon are standalone platforms where you can contribute on a monthly or on a one-time basis for coffee. For Patreon, it is a monthly service, anywhere from $1 to 10 to 25 And then we also have my PayPal button that is on my website, Have Roots, Will Travel. All of those are ways to help the channel grow and be able to offer the content it does. So thank you so much to all of you who have already contributed. And let's get going with uh, studying our next Fijoa. For our episode 231, we are studying Marguerite Ardion. And she is of your request, and I do have her in one of my files, which is a genealogy associate that I have worked closely with on French-Canadian research. So um, just she knows who she is. And um, let's explore Marguerite's life and how she came to New France. So she was born in 1639 in La Rochelle, France, to her parents, Pierre Ardion and Suzanne Lonnet. La Rochelle was founded during the 10th century and became an important harbor in the 12th. Until the 15th century, La Rochelle was to be the largest French harbor on the Atlantic coast, dealing mainly in wine, salt, and cheese. La Rochelle has one of the richest histories of all the towns of France, from its beginnings as an area where the Knights of Templar had their strongest base. Eleanor married Henry Plantagenet in 1152, who became King of England as Henry II in 1154, and thus put La Rochelle under Plantagenet rule until Louis VIII captured it in the 1224 siege of La Rochelle. While he was there, Henry II built the Vauclair Castle, which remains of which are still visible. Now, La Rochelle is famous for many things, but one of the things that it's famous for is how it became a center for the Huguenots. And it was in La Rochelle that the Protestant revolutions occurred and created the uprising that would become known as the Siege of La Rochelle. Throughout the 1600s, the Huguenots were expelled from La Rochelle. Now, why is this important? This is always important, but it's particularly important because Marguerite Ardion was Protestant, as were her parents, and she was baptized in the Protestant temple, which was later thrown down, of course. Um, and so that is the depictions of the church, of the temples or the churches that housed the Protestant population. Now, it's not for nothing that she would have come to New France, because obviously Protestants were not uh, welcomed in France and made it very difficult. Now, in Marguerite's case, she did actually convert before she came to New France. Let's have a look as to why. So Marguerite would marry a man named Laurent Baudet in, La, in France, presumably at La Rochelle, and she would have two children with him. Pierre, her firstborn, would pass away in 1662. Laurent, her secondborn, was born in 1662. We believe that her husband also died. Can you imagine the trauma of losing two ch a child, a husband, and ha having a newborn. I just can't believe how strong she is. Now, Laura would go, go on to marry um, Marguerite Louis Crevier and have um, two children who both, um, you know, survived to adulthood. Before he succumbed, we believe, before 1688, making him about 26 years of age. But Laurent would accompany his mother to New France. So she would come on the Phoenix de Flossange on June 30th, 1663, with Laurent in tow. Just amazing. That was the very first ship that brought Les Filles du Roi. The groom that she selected and who selected her was named Jean Rabouet, and he was born in 1637, also in La Rochelle, France. So that is pretty amazing. 
Now, around 1155, a chapel dedicated to Saint Nicolas existed on in La Rochelle. This chapel became the parish seat of this area, but like all the churches of La Rochelle, it was demolished during the Protestant era. Only the bell tower, like the one, um, remained standing to serve as a watchtower. Now, I want to draw your attention to the upper uh, left picture. That is what the church looked like in its heyday. And now, this is what it remains at. It is used um, for different, um, different things as well. So um, it's taken over by the customs house, I believe. It was a, wor um, a workhouse. Um, and then, um, and so it is really, truly a church that won't die. That's when I, when I read that story, I was like, wow, that's amazing. But that is who he is, um, his church is from. His parents were Francois Rabouet and Marguerite Chassé. So he is from that same area, Nouvelle-Aquitaine and Charles Maritim. Just amazing to have two people from the same place. So Jean came to New France in 1656. He was a plowman and he was hired for that specific function. So we can imagine that during these six years that he had before he got married, um, he would have uh, amassed a certain amount of land and property once he had finished his apprenticeship. So on October 28, 1663, they were married in Quebec City. So the family would settle on Ile d'Orléans, which is located in the St. Lawrence River, east of downtown Quebec, about three miles. The island was one of the first parts of the province to be colonized by the French, and a large percentage of French Canadians can trace their ancestry to the early residents of this island. The island has been described as a microcosm of traditional Quebec and as the birthplace of Francophones in North America. If any of you are wondering when it, why is it called Ile d'Orléans, it was actually um, given the name by um, the officials who wanted to, in honor of the second son of King Francis I. His name was Henri II, the Duke of Orléans, and that is why it's called Ile d'Orléans. But if you're looking old, in older French in, you know, research papers, I want you to be aware that it, it is called Grande Ile, Saint Marie, or Saint Laurent in certain periods. So you need to be aware of that because you're going to be like, okay, where is this place? Um, I was just there this summer. Some of these pictures are pictures I took. Just amazing, amazing place. And you can see um, that this church here is the Church of saint Famille, which was the very first one to be created. Um, in Dalian, is divided into six sections. So you need to know which section your particular family lived in. Um, so we have Saint-Pierre, saint Famille, saint Saint-François, Saint-Jean, Saint-Laurent, and saint Petronille. So all of those are distinct, um, distinct, I want to say, towns with their own churches and their own history. So it's very, very important when you're doing research on the island to know where your people were from. Here's the 1666 census. I was surprised when I saw this because it doesn't fit in with my, there's certain, you know, um, challenges to what has been accepted as fact in terms of the number of children. We have Jean and Marguerite and we have her son, Laurent. He's known as Rabouet, which you know, you know, it, that's not his name. Um, Marie, who was born, and then we have um, Marie Rabouet, um, who could be Suzanne. And then we have Simon Rabouet, eight months, a son. So this is something very new. And when I studied this, I went back to all the information I had. There was no son, Simon. So this is very, very interesting to say he's, he does not appear, so presumably he would have passed on. By the 1667 census, we have Jean Rabouet, Marie Penel. Remember, this is Marguerite, but they made mistakes along the way. We know that Laura, Marie, Suzanne, they are all there in 1667. So we know it's the right one. They just got her name wrong. So you need to always be thinking outside the box when you're doing any kind of research. Um, you need to verify and double check, but this is Jean Rabouet, and at this point, he has 
to Akbavala, which is about an acre of land on the island. They would go on to have eight children. Marie would marry François Perry and have six children, five of whom would make it. Suzanne married Jean Lefferty and had one child who made it to adulthood. She then married Pierre Desrochers and had three children who all survived. Marguerite married Louis Merci and had one child before her early death at 22. Elisabeth married Jean Caron and had two children, neither of whom survived before her early death at 22. Anne married Nicolas Poirier and had one child who, she, uh, who survived. She remarried Arnaud Mojoli but would die at 28. Marie Madeleine married Louis Campagna and had five children, all of whom made it. Jacques would die before the 1681 census. And Marie Angelique would also die before the 1681 census. Sometime between 1677 and 1678, Marguerite would pass away. She was at most 40 years of age. See, she and Jean would have been married a mere, at most 15 years. We will be continuing the saga Jean will carry on with another Fille Marie in episode 46, Marguerite Leclerc. So tune in next week. But before we say goodbye to Marguerite Algion, we can see that she left her mark um, when I was, this is the standard picture of, of uh, the monument at Saint Indolien uh, to the the founders of, of uh, Indolien, and I I was able to take pictures of all those names, and there's Jean Rabouet and Marguerite Alzion. So she lives on, not only uh, through her children, but also through um, a lasting legacy that she established at, Saint -Jean, at Indolien. Here are some of my favorite resources for looking for Les Filles du Roi. I want to point your attention to Généalogie Québec, which is a tremendous website. And yes, it costs money, but you get what you pay for because it truly has everything you could possibly want to know, I think. And I use it daily. So please, please have a look at that. Subscribe maybe for, you know, one month or something like that and see what you can find on Généalogie Québec. So we end episode 231. Wasn't she an amazing woman? I mean, she endured the loss of, of a husband in France, a child in France, was able to, you know, pick herself up by the bootstraps, come to New France on that very first ship, also was used to being persecuted as a Protestant, came to New France, uh, got remarried, had children, and ultimately she did die at very much too young, um, much too young, and we don't know the circumstances. Uh, probably in childbirth. Um, but what we do know is that she was a remarkable woman who left us with 133 descendants as of 1729, of which my viewer and my colleague are one of them, or among many, I'm sure. So we want to thank her for her bravery, for her tenacity, for her ability to forge ahead. This is something that um, it's part of the DNA, sometimes I think, of, of the descendants of these ladies, that no matter what happens, we keep going on. So I thank um, Marguerite Ardion for her contribution, for her sacrifice, and for her incredible life. Thank you so much, Marguerite. We bless your memory. And I also want to say thank you to my patrons, supporters, and subscribers. I thank you, and I'm grateful for each and every one of you and your contribution to my little YouTube um, channel here. I really, really can't thank you enough for the support you've shown me. So until I see you on episode 232, au revoir.